Welcome to another episode of the Battlefields and Bourbon Podcast. I'm Jack, joined as always with my co-host Elijah and reoccurring guest co-host. Once more. Once more again, Mr. Aaron Seaver. Aaron Civil War Travels is here. Aaron, thanks for being on. Thanks for having me yet again. Yeah, we are uh, we're coming to you live from the wonderful studio of ours in the historic Bell House in beautiful downtown Winchester, preserved by the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation, the official sponsor of the Battlefields and Bourbon Podcast. We've got an exciting episode for today. I'm super, super excited about our topics uh, or our topic. Um, and uh, But to, before we get into that, to, to kind of tie us in with our topic today is our bourbon that we'll be sipping on as we talk Civil War. So, Elijah, if you want to introduce us to what we will be sipping on today. So tonight's uh, bourbon is Blue Note Juke Joint Whiskey. Um, this one is produced by BR distilling company in memphis tennessee it's not actually distilled by them they source their bourbon um uh, i believe it comes from a couple different distilleries from what i've read um although i don't think anybody's entirely certain as to where it comes from um this one is the uncut unfiltered expression so it's just a single barrel pick for the brown bag a friend actually picked this up for me down in georgia um so it's a single barrel selection for that store um this one is 121.6 proof um, so it's, it's it'll be a little toasty. Um, the people listening can't see this, but I've already opened this one. This one came from my personal collection, so I've already tried it. I know it's good. Um, so this is going to be a fun one to have on the episode here tonight. Um, but from what I can tell or from, from what I've researched on this uh, bourbon, it is a 70% corn, 21% rye, 9% malted barley mash bill. Um, and people think that that came from the Green River Distilling uh, Company out in Owensboro, Kentucky, but again, not entirely sure. It's just something that's, you know, characteristic of their whiskeys. How are people um, living in like this world of unknowing, you know, unknowingness about <laughs> where the, the bourbon secret. comes from? The big secret. I don't know why you couldn't just trace that down. I mean, I feel like that's, that's gotta be like, well, with all the rules of what bourbon is, it's like when it comes to actually what's like, what is the percentage or where does it, where is it sourced? We don't have to tell you. I feel like we should know because I want to know what I'm sipping on and where it's coming from. The disclosure is nice because you want to make sure that it's not being, you yeah. know, brought in from some uh, shady, questionable distillery and that it's actually of good quality. Exactly. But I think the taste speaks for itself. Um, they do say on the back of the label that it's aged for a minimum of three years. Um, so, and you'll see by the color itself, it's not terribly dark. Yeah, it's um, light. For, for what it is. So it's, it's probably not aged for too terribly long. Um, but yeah, we can give this one a, a little pop. Um, if I can get it, that's the cork. Um, but yeah, to go along with, you know, Memphis, Tennessee and, uh, just Tennessee in general, what have we got this evening? Yeah, we're doing, uh, the battles of Fort Henry and Donaldson in that order. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, in te these are our first Tennessee battles we're talking about, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so we did Georgia, we did Pickett's Mill. So this is the furthest west we've been so far. Yeah, if people, yeah, people, if you, if listeners are like, because I think we were pretty proud of ourselves for doing Pickett's Mill. We were like, look at us doing Western theater. And then as I was researching this, I was like, the reason it's kind of called Western theater is because it was really out there in the West. And then the, as the war shifts on, it shifts closer. But um, but yeah, uh, uh, we're doing yeah, Fort Henry and Donaldson. This was one. Um, we kind of came on the mind to do, you know, I think back in December, I was thinking about this because it teed up with the anniversary of, uh, of the battle. The battle of Fort Henry is February 6th. And that is when we were recording this episode. So you guys are probably listening to this on February 7th, 2024, or any time in the future after that. <laughs> so, but for the sake of our civil war minds and us, uh, you know, in being historians, we, we're appreciating the fact that we are recording this on the anniversary of the battle of Fort Henry. So with that being said, we've all got our glasses poured. So what do we get off the nosing fellas? It's strong. Yeah. It's got some, it's got some kick, some kick to it. It's almost like a, it smells like a weeded bourbon to me with that kind of sweeter honey, honey, vanilla kind of, um, fresh bread note on that. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there's not any wheat in this mash bill, so I don't know why it would be giving that kind of profile to me. Um, it smells like something that's going to take away a sore throat. Yeah, I was going to say when <laughs> I, mean, I it smells good, but 
when I you know smell it, I definitely get the like a rubbing not rubbing alcohol, but like you you definitely know it's alcohol. How hot is she, Aaron? I mean, it's not terrible. You made some faces. I wish that the first. Well, I had a big could. gulp there. That first <laughs> initial hit, but yeah, once she went down, it does have some heat to it for for what it's, it is. It's, and I it's, think it's not due to the the age. heat is not long though. Oh uh, yeah, it's um, it dissipates fast. Yeah, very. It's definitely over. You know, hundred proof. Obviously, I get more of like a spice in a way, like a yeah. like a cinnamon type of spice. Um, not unpleasant. I'm glad it's February and I'm sipping on this because it's definitely one you want to drink in the winter time. One that I get from oh, that, yeah. um, from the times that I've had it prior to this episode, um, and you'll probably get the cinnamon type of deal as a gingerbread cookie. If that mm. one comes to mind, gingerbread shortbread cookie type of deal. Um, it's got that kind of light baked goods kind of note in there with the, obviously, the the spices and stuff like that as well. Yeah, yeah and being a Memphis crafted in Memphis, it said and allegedly, you know, blue note with the the label bottles. You know, it's an old Forester style bottle. I think, you know, it's it's reminiscent of that. Reminiscent of an um, old Forester shaped bottle, but it's playing on kind of the music theme of Memphis and it being a hotbed for blues and everything like that. So, but yeah, as far as I'm aware. Um, I don't think you can get this in Virginia. Oh. At least not yet. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, so to all of our, our local listeners and everything, um, you'll probably have to expand your search to a different state to find this stuff. Um, obviously, like I said, I had to have a friend uh, grab me one while they were on a trip down to Georgia. So that was the only way I was ever going to get that. Um, but in my travels as well outside of Virginia, like down through Georgia and Florida, it's pretty prevalent. Like you'll see it at any store. It's not hard to find. Um, I think I paid... 40 or 50 dollars for it so it's not like it's it's not too terribly expensive yeah. and it's readily available um and obviously these uncut unfiltered single barrel store picks like this one um they will vary from bottle to bottle based on proof age all that good stuff um, but blue note does do just regular bourbon as well um just a i don't know what the proof is on their regular stuff but this obviously being a barrel proof pick it's barrel proof um so yeah, I don't I'd, know. I don't know what their entry level proof is. I'd be interested to try the regular bourbons. Mm-hmm. Um, They've got a few different expressions in their lineup. So I mean, there's there's enough that, to go around, you know, to try. We've got other Tennessee topics to talk about, so we can always do something with them in the future. Yeah, with their other with their other products. Get closer to Memphis and stuff. Used to bring it on home for them. Yeah, I mean. It's it's not my favorite, but it's not bad. Like it's pretty. I think if it were aged longer, it would do it some favors. Yeah, it's young. I think that's the killer for it. It's missing that. It's missing that. Mm, a bur- the oakiness, you know oh, that. Aaron just like <laughs> pounded the rest of it. <laughs> it's a good burn. <laughs> it's a good burn. Right? Yeah, it's it's really young. I think that's my biggest. Yeah, you know fault with it and you can get that on the nose when you mentioned that ethanol kind of burn just on the nose itself if it were aged a little longer i think it would mellow out some more um and that proof wouldn't be so overbearing because 121 really in the grand scheme of a barrel proof isn't that much Hmm. compared to you know 130 that we had with old forester which i'm sure you would say is a a noticeable difference i mean this yeah and that's me nitpicking a uncut unfiltered you know Quote, it's more of a straight from the barrel type of yeah and that's probably something else i should mention that i'm sure people are like what does that mean uncut unfiltered um the uncut means that it's not cut with water it's not proof down it's barrel proof that's where uncut comes from um why wouldn't they just say barrel proof though i think some brands like to be more fancy with it. i know smoke wagon does that too there's other other brands that say that and then the filtering um comes from usually or some distilleries will chill filter a whiskey and there are a lot of conflicting uh, opinions on what filtration does to a bourbon. Um, they think that it will filter out some of the natural oils from the oak to, you know, it'll take away from the flavor profile. Yeah. Chill filtration, um, chilling it just to filter the, the whiskey to get all the, you know, the barrel particles and stuff out will sometimes apparently 
take away from the flavor. So that's neither cut nor filtered. So they might screen filter it just to get, you know, the big chunks of barrel char out when they pour it into the tank to bottle Thanks. it and everything. Um, but otherwise, it's it's not filtered. That's what you get from the barrel. So that's that's the purest form, I guess, aside from getting it straight out of the barrel. So my opinion on this <laughs> is... Come on in, Aaron. It's, it's, it's good. I really like it. Um, definitely, like I said, when you have a sore throat... <laughs> like I feel like my sinuses are clear. We're good, um, but that's that's something like you could sip that and then just go to bed. Like a it's, it's it's a nice nightcap. Yeah, I think it's a good one. Um, unfortunately, I I can't just you know supposedly we have this podcast to do, so I guess you can't I just stay, fall asleep. I guess I got to stay awake for that. No one wants to hear me snoring on here. Yeah, um, I but it's it's definitely a relaxing relaxing drink I, i'm really impressed by that good wintertime bourbon to have by the fire yeah, yeah for sure if we had a campfire here oh my god campfire <laughs> man there's a fireplace but i don't know if we can use it <laughs> all right well fort henry fort henry let's start fort off Thompson. let's start off with fort henry yes aaron do you mind setting us up for how we get to where we are at this point in the Civil War in the West, just a brief overview to set us up for, Jan- you know, 1862 in yeah. the West. So, you know, in our last, uh, the last episode, your last episode, um, which I was a guest on, we talked about the Romney campaign and how Jackson is making some moves over here in Virginia. And that's really the only thing happening there. Uh, but here in the West, you've got a lot of moves being made. Uh, by Ulysses S. Grant, and he is—he's uh, going to fight at a, a battle at Belmont, and after uh, lose is, that one, correct? <sighs> Technically, <laughs> um, they—they they, kind of initially win it, and then this is this is when Grant. One thing about Grant is he learns from any mistakes he makes, um, at least in war. <laughs> um, personal life, he had a little little issue, but. Um, at Belmont, you know that's a, that's a a sixty one battle, and he's he's going to learn from that that you know they take this Confederate camp and then uh, the the Confederates come back. So he learns from that, but he sees immediately the advantage of takings of taking Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. Yeah. Fort Henry opens up your Tennessee River. Fort Donelson opens up the Cumberland. Mm-hmm. You do that, you not only have the, that upper area of the rivers, but you've got all the supply, the railroads. I mean, it's just a, a huge supply hub for the Union Army, and you're going to push down. I mean, if we look at this map, you can see how close Pittsburgh Landing and Shiloh, which will be fought in April, are to this. They're not that far away. You know, we're almost to the Mississippi border. Um, really, with these, I mean, it's a good little while. Little, uh, little trek down there, but you know, they're going to occupy the Memphis and Ohio railroad. Um, the mobile and Ohio railroad is going to come under them. The Nashville and Northwest railroad, they're going to just capture all this stuff. If they can capture these, these forts and that's, what's in their way is these forts. Um, they're Fort Henry itself is not heavily manned. Um, the construction of it is, not great. Questionable <laughs> um, at best. <laughs> it's questionable. It sits in a very low area. Uh, one reason Grant is excited to make this advance against it is he's been told the parapets, you know, the fort walls are only 10 feet high. Well, you can launch shells in there all day, and, you know, it's not going to matter. Um, now, comparatively speaking, just for reference, Donaldson, if I remember reading this right, it's 20 feet high, 20, 20 feet thick. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're high and thick and it's, and it's on a commanding high ground, high ground where Henry is sitting in a flood area. <laughs> um, and you know, if you went to Fort Henry today, you would not see Fort Henry. You'd see some of the outer works, uh, some of the, the trenches that were made by Confederates and union, but most of what you would be looking at is water. Yeah. Fort Henry was fully submerged. Yeah. When the Tennessee River was dammed back in, I think, the 30s. Yeah. And what is now created, like, I think it's called Kentucky Lake or something. something like it's a that. lake, yeah, it's a lake area, area. 
uh, along the Tennessee. Still accessible to go and see. There are signs there. And I think there's some, like you said, some there's, earthworks. Yeah, there, there's there. earthworks, um, and, and I'm sure we'll. You guys will probably post some pictures of those. So I have those. Um, I've I've been on the ground. Yeah, and been able to walk on the. There is a, a road there that's still historic, um, and and some some earthworks on the outside of where the fort was. So that there is still stuff to see there. It's just not a lot. Yeah, and and going back to the maps, if any of you folks at home want to follow along with the maps we're looking at, uh, all the maps we're using for this episode reference-wise as we talk and discuss are courtesy of Hal Jesperson's Cartography Services. Um, so if you go to Hal's website, he has some free Wikipedia maps on there, so these are the same that you'll see uploaded to Wikipedia pages about battles. So that's www.cwmaps.com. And you just scroll till you find some of the maps. So right off the bat, we're referencing the Fort Henry campaign map for a lot of our our understanding. And yeah. when you're looking at that, to understand a little bit too is, you know, what areas of the West are important. Obviously, you have the Mississippi River and the Confederates are in control of New Orleans, but um, the Federals are in control of the upper the the upstream portions of the Mississippi like Cairo and other areas along the uh, Mississippi River. Now, when you get close to the, you know, state lines, specifically between, like, Kentucky and Tennessee, is where any northward advance that the Confederates were trying to make in 1861 is, uh, this this line. So, and it's it's a east-to-west or west-to-east line into the north, into this, um, you know, Kentucky is still an... A, a, yeah, Kentucky's huge. Kentucky's big, but Kentucky's not a Confederate state. It's not a, um, so, technically a Union state. Yeah. It's very split, but it's yeah. remaining neutral. Yep, so in the advance, it, these Confederates try to get as uh, hold post as north as as far north as they can. Um, and this line they form is not like one continuous front, but it is connected between some parallel points. Um, on the Mississippi River, you have close to the Mississippi, you've got uh, Polk at Columbus, Kentucky, and then moving east from there, you've got Bowling Green, Kentucky, where um, Albert Sidney Johnson's troops are, and then uh, at the Cumberland Gap, um, you have some more Confederates. So you've got this west to east, as I've described it, uh, position of Confederate troops. And then like Aaron was saying, What's important geographically and physically in the Western theater of, of the war at this point is transportation hubs. And with the large, and it's very, you, can, you know, this is mirror for mirror what's happening in the East, yeah. but I feel like in the East, it's at a much smaller scale. You know, you can only Way get smaller. the riverboats so far up the James or so far up the York or whatever, the, the Potomac, yeah. things like that. Uh, yeah. But they're important for transportation things. Same thing with railroads. Railroads are used for troop movements in the east, but a lot of supplies is what the supply movement is what the focus is for why you'd want to take those resources out. Now, when you move to the west, when it comes to this wide area you want to attack or take control over, the federals understand that these rivers are important, like the Cumberland and the Tennessee and the Mississippi for transportation of goods mm-hmm. and resources, but as well as troops. If you want to get troops across this larger area, you need to use those waterways and as well as the railroads. And they've identified, like Aaron was saying, the to, to begin this initiative, the Columbus and – Columbus, right? No. What, what is my other river? Cumberland, sorry. So the Cumberland <clears throat> and Tennessee act as avenues of invasion into the heart of the Confederate – position in early 1862 just as the valley and other rivers in the east are avenues of invasion these rivers are going to serve as direct lines into the hearts of this northern you know line of of confederate defensive well and you you look at it too uh, you reference the the rivers there in virginia you know the james and stuff those are east to west rivers you know yeah these are north-south rivers. These are splitting the Confederacy in half, too. You're splitting Tennessee and Kentucky. You're, you know, Mississippi, obviously, you take You're splitting it east to west. Yeah. yeah. You're, splitting, you're splitting up the Confederacy, 
And um, so that's a huge thing. You control that. You control a lot of territory and a lot of supply. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, right before the battle, uh, it's, it's around January 30th of 1862 that General Grant's going to receive that long – anticipated word he's he's been kind of clamoring for this he's told halleck i want to attack fort henry and i can do it and i can take it and halleck halleck's gonna back off and be like well i don't know yeah. <laughs> you know this, and halleck has this preconceived because halleck relieves fremont yes in the west and halleck has this preconceived idea that uh, of he has this preconceived judgment of grant yes because of what he's heard with his you know drinking, drinking and things before the action the at belmont yeah um and, and you look at the west before this i mean we look at the western theater and we think oh yeah i mean the union really had a good run out there but you you look at it from 61 to this early part of 62 wilson's creek was a confederate victory big confederate victory right after one? manassas there's another one out there. um and you've got one in kentucky maybe was there a battle in kentucky don't think so. There was that. another key Confederate There's victory key, though in the yeah, West. It's, it's a smaller on a smaller scale, but they and you've got troops that are getting you know commanders that are getting kind of shuffled. Um, Fremont, for instance, is getting pushed out of there. Now you've got Halleck in command. You've got Grant had this battle at Belmont that's basically a loss, and so Halleck, yeah, he's he's a little wary of Grant. He's not sure what to do with him if he's uh, if he's actually, you know, up for the challenge. But Grant's been – he's chomping at the bit for this. And he wants to use the Navy. Which yeah, is, which I think is cool. Is a cool thing. And it's it's really the first time that a good joint operation is going to happen. Um, he's going to get word on January 30th that, yes, you and Flag Officer Andrew Foote – are going to lead a joint expedition against twin forts, Forts Henry mm-hmm. and Fort Donaldson. Now, they're only about 10 to 12 miles away. One's on the Cumberland, that would be Donaldson. The other one's on the Tennessee River. And just to be clear, flag officer, I believe, is the synonym for what is today an admiral. They just didn't have the yeah. rank of admiral back then, Yeah, is my I, understanding. They, they will go to the rank of admiral during the war. Yeah. Yeah, I think he'll be called Admiral Foot later. Um, but it, in this early, early stages that... that We'd have to look that up. Um, I'm not as versed on the Navy as I'd like to be. Um, now we, I think we have a coworker that might actually know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, he's gonna he's gonna get that, and and Grant he's gonna jump at that opportunity. February second, uh, he's gonna move a force of fifteen thousand soldiers, four ironclads, and three timberclad ships toward Fort Henry. The Confederates. Severely outnumbered here. <laughs> they, they only have like 3,000 guys there. Um, and they're commanded by Brigadier General Lloyd Tillman. Um, he He's aware of what's happening. Uh, the Confederates, you know, Fort Henry, like we talked, is in a terrible spot. Uh, they do make Fort Hyman, which is across the river from Henry. Uh, it's on a little bit higher ground. It kind of is another commanding area. But they don't have the troops to... To occupy both. And that one was partially incomplete in terms of construction, too, yeah, it wasn't hadn't, it? hadn't been fully completed yet, no. Um, so, you know, the, this movement toward Henry, uh, you've got Confederates down here, including the general, that knows what's – he knows what's coming. Once he realizes those gunboats are coming down the river and the men are – you know, he's going to have a lot of infantry coming to him. Uh, the Confederate spirits are kind of low – where the opposite is true for the Union, they are going to be – they're ready to ready to fight. Yeah. Um, by the 5th, they start – by the 5th, yeah. though, they they know what's happening, and they start sending Confederates – a large Back majority of the Confederates to Donaldson, correct? Yeah. Leaving so the, a small force behind. There's a small force behind. Um, and you got to think, too, what these guys have. You know, the Union Army, even in 62 – Early 62, they're still going to be, they, they got the most modern weapons and things like that. They're getting supplied with good stuff, especially with having Halleck there. Halleck is not the best field commander, but as far as getting stuff done administratively, mm-hmm. he's on point. 
The he knows what he's doing. The, the Confederates, they had – Yeah, they got flintlocks. Flintlocks, yeah. They got flintlocks, War of 1812 stuff. Um, and then you, you put on the inclement weather. The guys are sick. Um, Fort Henry's walls – were it says here we're 20 feet high and 20 feet thick at the base but the rains and the swollen river um are going to leave it submerged and actually i think it, it it'll at some places they're only 10 feet high they're not they're not very thick um so yeah february 4th and 5th grant's infantry is going to disembark out of range of Fort Henry. Henry, Henry, even though it's in a bad spot, still has some good range up the river. Because it it's it's at the it's at the start of a bend. It's right at the start of a bend. So it has a good straight shot yep. downstream, but it's the the end comparatively of, on land. It's on a low lower yes terrain. And of course, obviously today it's it's underwater. Underwater. Um, but yeah, Till, Tillman's gonna he's gonna withdraw entirely from the incomplete walls of Fort Hyman. And, which is on the west bank of that river, and dispatched the majority of his force inside to Fort Henry uh, and then overland to the more defensible Fort Donaldson. Donaldson's in a great spot, uh, but we'll get to that here in a little bit. Uh, he determines to make a stand at Henry because he, he knows those gunboats are coming, and he doesn't want he doesn't want to abandon that. Now Grant wants to take Fort Henry and make a camp out of it. That's a, that's a foothold. Yeah, on that, sorry. I think that when he when he made his initial request, it was to take Fort Henry and make a camp there. Yeah, and can't you know wants to make a camp there. That's the initial initial thing. Uh, the Union victory there is actually pretty quick. Yeah, um, so let's let's talk about that. Yeah. Let's talk about the plan. So Grant's going to unload portions of his uh, federal force, his 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 divisions. Um, Passing bourbon here, folks. Um, he's going to, like Aaron said, north of Fort Henry, a couple miles, I think over eight miles away, um, or right about eight miles. He'll unload um, his divisions um, on either side of the ten- of the Tennessee River. He'll, he's The attack is a three-prong attack. He's going to send um, Smith's division on the east or the west side of the Tennessee River and uh, McClear, I can never say his name. McClearnand, McClearnand, because I want to say McClellan, but McClearnand. Yeah. Um, Oglesby, Wallace, they're all going to. Well, I think they're all under McClearnand. They're under McClearnand. Yeah, in so brigades. Part of, but they're the split up a little bit. Is to send the infantry around the backside of the fort, is it not? While yeah. the gunboats keep them occupied. Yeah, that's where the that's where McClearland and uh, McClearnand. And uh, so yeah, McClernand. Yeah, it's messing me up. So Smith is going to take. Like saying McClellan. I know Smith is going to take the west side of the Tennessee River, ultimately to take Heim, Fort Hyman because mm-hmm. they believe there's Confederates there. There's no Confederates there. Um, Grant, and then with McClernand's guys, they're going to come around, and like you said, they're going to come around basically to the rear or flank of Fort Henry, but also what's in that path is those critical roads of retreat. Uh, to block that way of retreat from the Confederates, but the Confederates are already on the move. M- the mass majority that are going to be sent out are already gone. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, the the fleet under um, the fleet of ironclads and and timberclads under foot is going to start moving upriver um, mm-hmm. slowly. And I think they get to a point of about I think it's close to eight miles or so, or no, no, it might be two miles north or upstream downstream from Fort Henry. Um, it's about a mile actually. And they're just, and I think this might happen the day before, but they're mm-hmm. going to test the, they're going to engage with Fort Henry. Yeah. Um, they just to see 300 yards. I'm pretty sure. Well, Let's at first they want to see yeah, what the range gonna is going to go, be. They're going to, they're going to stop about a mile or yeah, about a mile away. And then they're going to move up toward Fort Henry. They're trying, like you said, they're trying to figure out that range, figure out what the range is. And I'll let you take it over from there. You said it's a pretty quick battle, Aaron. Yeah, it is. Um, honestly, it's a quick Union victory. They have greater manpower, greater artillery. Uh, Foot and his ships are going to wreak havoc on the Confederate defenses for two hours. Two hours. Yeah, they put up a <laughs> um, heck of a fight. Inflicting casualties, destroying the artillery. The magazine's underwater. The prairie grounds are underwater. So, I mean, there's not a lot there for them to defend. Um and after these casualties and this destroying of the artillery, Confederate General 
Lloyd Tillman's going to say, ask Foot for his terms of surrender. Now we know what Grant will say at Fort Donaldson, but Foot is going to say 10 days before Donaldson, your surrender will be unconditional. Yeah. But Grant gets the credit for it because he says, I know we were talking about this earlier today. I I think it's important to note here too. I believe it's during this is during the initial, you know, feeling out phases on the river. uh, Grant is on the ironclad Essex. And while he's on Essex, they begin to become under fire with the testing of everything. And, um, the Essex will be hit. Um, nothing to damage it, but, um, it's enough to freak, you know, Grant's like, oh, Grant's a little shook up there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's there's four of those ironclads there and three of those timber clads um, engaged at Fort Donaldson. And um, what, what will happen is you said the terms will be unconditional. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately, uh, Tillman will give up his sword yes. and surrender. Uh, to, to Elijah's point about the 300 yards, the flotilla will get into position less than 300 yards from the fort once they figure out kind During of the, the engagement, range. I During believe. the actual engagement. Because they just get almost frustrated um, in a way and just bring the go- boats they just up get to the up front. There, yeah. And then you've got the infantry coming in the rear. Yeah. Um, now, was it the Essex or was it a different one that took the shot to the center boiler? Might have been the Essex. And knocked it out of commission for the entirety of that. I think that's the Essex. Yeah. Now, um, one thing to note here. Oh, I'm sorry. The Cincinnati here. The Cincinnati took 32 hits. St. Louis, yeah. seven. The Carnalot, six. Um, the Essex was out of commission with 32 Union casualties in one shot. Yeah. I one shot. The Dis- shot for disabled sure. her for the rest of the campaign. So the Essex is going to be knocked out. Uh, but, you know, these other these other ships are taking some – they're taking a pounding. Oh, yeah. But because of that heavy – uh, union presence and those and those big guns on those on those boats, um, you know the Confederates for their guns, uh, they're they're going to lose them. There's four big guns in the fort uh, for heavy guns, and they're lost with along with 21 Southerners. Um, you know, so their their biggest score is going to be that big hit on the Essex. Yeah, uh, but other than that, they uh, they a morale surrend- boost. Yeah, those. <laughs> They'll surrender. Now, there, there will be a ceremony on board the USS Cincinnati after this where 12 officers and the 82 men that are left there will actually um, surrender. Grant, Grant's infantry is slowed by the muddy roads. During this whole time, there's weather. There's rain happening. So the the infantry trying to come across, you know, into the behind and across over at Fort Hyman um, are bogged down with this wet road. Obviously, water is going to affect the boats as much. Um, so the, the surrender actually will go to foot. Uh, Grand, Grant's infantry won't arrive at Fort Henry until after. Uh, but the casualties here, I always found this very minimal. It's minimal, but I always find it in, in, I mean, you got most of your casualties coming from the boats, right? Mm-hmm. You got 42 union casualties, only 21 Confederate. Now, that's the casualties. You add in the fact of, of the 12 officers, 82 men surrendering, it goes up, but it's, that just shows you how little men were actually there. Yeah. It's, during the they, attack they've too. already moved. Um, now grant, when he gets there, we'll find a large quantity of provisions, uh, six cannons that can be moved, but they're mired in the mud. Um, and the evidence of the Confederates being alert, but getting the heck out of it. Yeah. I think there was pots full of stew and food still on the oh yeah they vacated that and they and they quick. just left so by the time the federals get there they were like whoa now yeah. what's something that's important to note and this is just purely um i guess anecdotal how do you think being going into this battle these confederates that are at fort henry that are already in low spirits due to just their conditions and the and the position that they're in right now the ones that get left behind to defend fort henry the very few that do get chosen to be left behind and the ones that have to just to surrender, it's like man, like we're really getting the short end of the stick here because we're just getting the hell shelled out of us. And then on top of that, you know, the surrender. I mean, they had to know what was coming to them, and they're just like they still have to put up a fight regardless. They still have to do their duty, but just you know, in the face of what is obviously like uh, you're 
hey, you, you got the short end of the stick here. You're the sacrificial lamb. Yeah, it would yeah, be interesting like, to read some of those accounts if there I mean, are any. Yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately, a bunch are going to be captured. And, yeah. you, and you yeah. look at it, I mean, what bravery. You know, whether it's Confederate or Union, what bravery to stand there and know that's happening. Know that's coming. You've got a massive Union force coming down on you. Um, I think it's... it's and you got seven gunboats. 15,000 Union soldiers. Like, you know the outcome of that. Like, you know what's about to happen here. This, there's yeah. no, oh, we might pull this one off, guys. I mean, you already got to know, given the condition that Fort Henry is in at the start of this battle, it's, it's kind of obvious what's coming to you. Um, so I'm sure the ones that did get to uh, retreat back to Fort Donaldson probably, you know, had a sigh of relief as they're retreating. Like, oh, oh man, we, we got it there. Absolutely. But, I mean, you look at the limited scope of this battle and its casualties, it's not a lot. Uh, but the fall of Fort Henry, the fall of Fort Henry itself is massive. That opened your Tennessee River. They've already went away from Fort Hyman, so now they're at Fort Henry. Fort Henry's taken. The Tennessee River's wide open. You know, so this is – and that that allows – Grant being able to occupy that – is going to allow him to attack Fort Donaldson and open up that Cumberland River. Um, however, before that, there is another little expedition. Uh, between between the time of Fort Henry and Donaldson, you're going to have what's called the Timberclad Raid. Um, that's going to be the, the Timberclads known as the Tyler, Conestoga, and Lexington. So these were the three that would have been Attached with the the ironclads during yes. the battle. Yes, they're part of Foot's uh, Foot's little little force there. Um, and these guys, they're going to make it as far as Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and they're going to destroy supplies, infrastructure as they go. Um, and they're going to even capture an, in, an incomplete Confederate ironclad called the Eastport. Um, the biggest flaw is that in this is that they spared a railroad bridge at Florence, Alabama. Um, and that, that's going to play a critical role two months later at the Battle of Shiloh. But uh, that'll be another podcast. Yeah. No, it is interesting. If you look at the Fort Henry campaign map, the Hal Jesperson map we've referenced, just to see the distance they take going that far south is pretty oh, yeah, crazy. I mean, they cut moving. through the entire north to south, you know, from north to south, the entire state of Tennessee – and, you know, two, two, three days, two days uh, all along the Tennessee River. So that's it's just crazy to to see yeah. it on a shown on a map. And I, I think this is a, a good point uh, here is, you know, the biggest benefit of victory is not the capture of the fort. But the, the Tennessee River is now open, like we were talking. This is vulnerable, as we'll see with the Tipperclan raid. It's vulnerable to thrust by the Federal Navy. Without Fort Henry, the Confederates have no other fortifications blocking that river yeah. at that point. Um, and, and it opens up, like we were talking earlier, it opens up the railroads. It opens up the waterways. Um, it, it allows the Union to destroy what they don't need. Uh, the important railroad bridges upriver, the Memphis and Ohio Railroad is is now under their control. Uh, a span of uh, a few miles to the south, even, um, will come under them. And and you know, we kind of forget about this guy. The the general in charge of all of this is General Albert Sid, Albert Sidney Johnston, um, and he is in command. Of all of these forces, he is supposed to protect this area, and he can't. He doesn't have the troops to do it. He's only got total in his whole whole district seventy thousand men. That's yeah, including think, those guys. I think when it was said he was arriving to take command, he was coming with like fifteen regiments, but it was just him. It was him. Like it was yeah. just him. There was no regiments. There was no regiments with him. Yeah. Yeah. So if you when you look at that Fort Henry map and kind of what I was describing, being able to cut across a state north to south. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I was saying, how it can be used as, these rivers can be used as avenues of invasion. And then going towards the second river, the, the Cumberland River, where Fort Donaldson is located, if you clear that path, you're straight into uh, the heart of Tennessee to Nashville, the capital of the state. Um, so moving to 
um, the, the, the battle of Fort Donaldson, it's going to take, so the distance between Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson is about 12 miles. Yeah, 10 to 12 miles. And it's normally a day's march. Um, and, and they'll take off from, uh, Fort, Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry, as all the federals kind of regroup around Fort Henry, you know, Smith's division gets across, um, and McClurlin, McClernand's guys are all there. So they'll regroup and then they'll move west or east to Fort Donaldson. Um, Wallace will um, will take an alternate route to get there, um, but that is uh, they will move west to east, and um, I believe they leave on the eleventh. So as yeah. they leave on the eleventh. They'll head west, and it's I think it's really nice weather. But we're we're talking February, um, yeah. And they start dropping their blankets, dropping their overcoats, very similar to what we talked about in the last episode. Yep, in the Romney campaign. Yeah, yep. it was in the Romney campaign. Uh, but they're going to quickly yeah. regret that, and um, very much so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they they arrive to the area surrounding Fort Donaldson. I believe it's. Uh, Men under McClernand that are gonna they they come into zero you know almost no Confederate contact on the way except for some I believe it's Oglesby guys uh, Oglesby's mm-hmm. uh, men under McClernand are gonna come into contact with uh, not yet famous Nathan Bedford Forrest uh, he will be along one of the roads there but no 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 major contact is made from that correct and the Confed the Federals pretty much arrive unscathed. Uh, up into the you know to the area around Fort Donaldson and the the, the town of Dover, Tennessee. Um, so, Aaron, what yeah. we're now there. So it's, we we finished the timberclad raid, and that that's a huge thing in between these forts that gets that gets lost. And you know, we finished that. They they've been able to disrupt a lot of movement for the Confederates. So now, yeah, they we're moving to Fort Donaldson, about twelve miles away from Fort Henry. Um, the forces engaged there. We're going to have about 40,000 total forces, 24,531 for the union, 16,171 for the Confederates. And, uh, I always think this is a, a massive, uh, thing with the casualties is 16,537. So it sounds like the whole Confederate force plus some, um, but early, you know, Go back to the rivers. Early in the war, the Union commanders know that the control of these rivers is the key to success here in the Western Theater. And after capturing Fort Henry on February 6th, Grant's going to advance those 12 miles to Donaldson. When he does, now granted, that is on the Cumberland River. When he does, these guys are... Fort Henry was so easy. It's... Sounds bad, but Fort Henry was so easy. It, was, it wasn't it was heavily manned. It was in a low area. The Navy took it. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's crazy how quickly it fell. Donaldson is a different story. Grant, but Grant and Foote are going to go in with the thought process that this is going to fall quick. It does not fall quick. Um, when they get there, the the defenses of Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland River are very, very formidable. Um, I've stood on the ground. I've been to the battery where you can sit and actually look out over the river and see where these guns are firing. Um, and, and it's just, it's amazing. Like there is no way if you're coming up, on, you know, coming up that river on the Cumberland River in a ship that those guns are not going to wreak havoc on you. and And they will. I think the big asset to Fort Donaldson is its location with elevation and, and its elevation. It's got that elevation yep. and it's, it's high a, above the Cumberland River. It is an amazing place to go and see. Um, so I encourage anybody to go and see that. It's a national park, right? It is a national park, yes. Um, but the op- operations against Donaldson are part of an amphibious campaign launched in 62 uh, to push those Confederates out of middle and western Tennessee. And this will, this will open the path to the southern heartland, as you were saying, Jack. This brings you right down through it. This is going to enable them to capture not only the rivers, but Nashville. Nashville is a major supply hub uh, in the Confederacy. And that's, I, if I remember correctly, that's the first capital in the Confederacy to fall. 
I think it's Nashville. Nashville. Um, but it has to do with the railroads. Um, like I said, Nashville's a huge su- supply depot uh, that the Un- Union Army will use in the West. After the fall of Fort Henry there on February 6th, Grant's going to determine to move quickly to try to capture Fort Donaldson, uh, again, located on the Cumberland River. Uh, he's he's going to boast that he's going to take Donaldson by February 8th. So two days after February 6th, you know, two days after Fort Henry's fallen, he says he's going to quickly uh, take this, but he's going to run into some challenges. The poor winter weather. Again, we're in February. February's a, a crazy month. Uh, his reinforcements are going to be late to arrive. And he's going to have difficulty moving those ironclad ships up the Cumberland based on you know the rains that have been coming in, the weather that's been coming in. Even though the river's rising, those ships have to navigate that. They have to navigate that current and try not to float down river. Um, they have to, you know, I think there's one one talk about one of the ships throwing their engines on as hard as they can. It might be the Condolette. Uh, throwing the engines in full force and they've got both anchors down and the men are doing everything they can so the ship doesn't float down river just to keep it where it needs to be. They're Yeah, they're fighting against the currents. Yeah, and, and they had a conviction at this point. They've just taken Fort Henry very easily. They have a conviction that no earthen fort can stand the Union gunboats. That's not exactly true. Um, as Albert Cindy Johnston is going to allow that garrison to stay at Fort Donaldson and remain, um, he sends new commanders and reinforcements there. On February 11th, Johnston is going to appoint G- Brigadier General John B. Floyd as the commander of Fort Donaldson uh, in the surrounding region. It's important to know, too, when we're talking about Fort Donaldson, it's not like, yes, there's a specific earthwork named Fort Donaldson, but for the sake of the battle and, and how this all plays out and what the scene is, how the scene is set, there's outer is, defenses. yeah, these outer defenses that are surrounding yes. where a lot of this, a lot of major, uh, conf, you know, Confederate earthworks are going to be set up uh, almost in a crescent shape uh, surrounding the area of Fort Donaldson and the, the town of Dover. Um, yeah. with some roads, the same roads that uh, lead from Fort Henry to Fort Donaldson that come into the town of Dover are going to be, you know, guarded by these Confederates that are that are set up in these uh, earthworks that, you know, line the perimeter of any Union attack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Dover is a major part of Fort Donaldson. The town, again, have been there, have been able to be on the ground there. It's amazing. You've got to... You know, if you get a chance to go there, definitely do so. Um, it'll blow your mind. How, yeah, researching this how, one, I've really wanted to go. How big that fort really is and how much Dover the town plays a role in it. Dover's pretty small today, too, still, right? It's still small. Yeah, it's still small. They have a lot of Civil War history there. They have um, a lot of relic shows, too. A lot of relic shows. They they do a lot of, history. of cool things. How there. much of the like the main fortification is still left? Oh, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a good bit. Um, obviously much more than Fort Henry. Yeah. Um, you know, you can walk down to the battery, uh, and I'm sure we'll post a picture of it, Mm -hmm. but you can walk down to the battery and see just how dominant that is on the Cumberland Mm -hmm. river. It's, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, so Floyd's going to be the first guy that, that gets in there. Uh, then you're going to have Gideon pillow show up and these guys are going to, they're going to talk for a little while and they're going to make an attack. The The Confederates aren't going to sit here and let the Union attack them the whole time. Excuse me. They, they are actually going to attack the, I believe it's, I guess it's going to be the Union right flank. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to attack that and they're going to take a lot of property from the Union Army. They're going to push them back. Uh, but the problem is they're going to be pulled back after that yeah i and i think on the you know grant arrives i mean some most of his troops arrive around the 13th the 12th and 13th yes i think there's some federal attack um some federal attacks there and they're not told to bring on a large engagement yet yeah um 
But what, they almost can't help themselves. Once in some those situations. gunboats, once those gunboats are knocked off. Now here's the thing: those gunboats, after they're pushed back, they're gonna they're gonna leave. Grant is gonna determine at that point he probably needs to do a siege of Fort Donaldson. Um, so that's a, that's a different thing. Um, but as I said, you know, with the Confederates greening that ground, uh, the Union Army is going to retreat, but inexplicably, the Confederates, after they've gained that ground, uh, they're going to order their forces back to their earthworks. And this causes them to abandon the hard-fought ground that they got that morning, um, which is, uh, yeah, I believe the morning of the 14th. Um, they're going to have this ground and then they're going to give it up. And Grant is not, you know, this is where we see Ulysses S. Grant really come into his own. He's going, he's not going to sit back and go, okay, well, let's see what they do. He's going to take a ground back. He's going to set, you know, send his, uh, his guys, Lou Wallace and McLaren, and he's going to tell them to retake that ground. And then he's going to ride up to the union left and he's going to order an attack on the Confederate words opposite where Brigadier General Charles F. Smith's division is. And he he reasons correctly that the Confederate right had to have been graciously reduced in strength and given because of that heavy assault on the Confederate left, which was the Union right. The Confederates had moved so many men there. Grant sees that. Takes and he the ground knows back. the Confederate right is weak. Yeah, yeah. Takes it yeah. back and goes and just hammers them. I mean, and when you're when you're like researching and understanding this battle, you see that Confederate attack uh, on the morning of February fifteenth, and it's just it's this massive, almost flank attack mm-hmm. to to the Union right, and it's impressive. I mean, they move, they move a lot of troops out of the way, but in turn, Grant's able to re reshift his troops around. Yeah. But you know, it took a lot of those Confederates to come around. And, and make that attack. They were able to do so because of the suppression of sound with the snow on the ground, no foliage making noise. Yep. You know, they were ordered troops on both sides were in cases ordered not to start fires to, you know, alert of their position. Exactly. So, but it's this massive attack that you'd think, Oh, well, this is it. They seal, they seal the day. They, they, um, they take the ground, they take the field. This is huge. Only then, to retreat. Only, only to retreat. Which makes absolutely no sense. Um, if you, I mean, just just studying this battle, it may, still to this day makes absolutely no sense what they're thinking there, because um, they've got Grant reeling. They've got you know the gunboats are gone. They've got Grant pushed back. They've gained this ground, and then they just give it up. And they it's, it's similar All to yeah, similar to in Virginia. You know, we look at Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee, if you gave him the the initiative, he pounced on it. The same thing happens in the West. You give Grant the initiative, he is not going to let that pass by, and he doesn't. Um, he's going to seize that opportunity, order his guys to go just take yeah, the – Yeah, Lou Wallace has taken the, yeah, taking take the Confederate back. left, and and Smith's taken the taking the Confederate right. And, and on that Confederate uh, left flank – when Sis, when Smith's division surges forward, they're going to overwhelm, overwhelm a lone Confederate regiment. They're occupying occupying the rifle pits in advance of the Confederate line. Um, they're going to com- just capture large stretches of the earthworks before dark on the 14th, and, and that's just that makes that position almost untenable. Uh, during the night of the 15th and 16th, you're going to have the Confederate leaders start discussing their options. And I'm, I'm sorry, it may be the, actually the 15th. Yeah, I know. You meant the 15th. 15th. They're making that attack. I'm sorry. I was thinking about Valentine's Day. I it's know. coming up. Don't forget to get your wife something cool. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the 15th, during that night from the 15th into the 16th, the Confederates are going to start talking they have a about council of war. Yeah, whether they need to retreat or not. And, and there's going to be a lot of disagreements. They made headway earlier in the day. But in the end, they're going to determine that surrender is their only viable option for that garrison. General Floyd and Pillow, who are on location, will abandon their men and flee across the river. Hmm. While Lieutenant Colonel, at this time, Nathan Bedford Forrest, is absolutely disgusted. Yeah. 
with the Confederate decision to surrender. He think, wants nothing. Of I think it. he says something like, I didn't, you know, I didn't come here to, to surrender, surrender this. my post or something. Yeah. And he just leaves. He's going to escape <laughs> down the Charlotte road. Now, granted the Charlotte road is like a sheet of ice. What, what we, what we kind of failed to talk about when we talk about the weather turning ill, turning bad, we're not talking just rain. We're talking ice, snow. That is a slippery, slippery place that Nathan Bedford Forrest is going down. But he's going to get his cavalry out of there. The generals who fought at Donaldson, you know, they're getting out of there. Um, these guys had all known each other. They're going to leave a guy named Samuel Buckner in command of the garrison. Yeah, I think there's – I don't know if it's Floyd or another – General that says, I think he serves as secretary of something under Buchanan before the war. Um, and he, I think it's Floyd. And he's worried about what will happen to him if he surrenders. And yeah, I believe that that is Floyd. He's worried that he if he gets captured, he's going to be hung. Or yeah, so he's like, I resign my command. Next person takes it. Well, that that person <laughs> that ends up gives being it Gideon up. Pillow who who says, no, I don't want anything to do with it. And then so, it ends up on Buckner. Poor Simon Buckner. Now, Buckner... And this, this is what makes the Civil War so great. Well, great. Great like and, fascinating. and it's fascinating, yeah. <laughs> great to us. Um, Samuel Buckner and Ulysses S. Grant are friends. Buckner has bailed Grant out a couple times with monetary Listen, aid. Yeah. And, you know, Grant, in his civil life, and he, he even says in his memoirs, he was not great. Like, everything the man touched just went to crap. Unless it was in the military. As a military general or as a leader of men, he was awesome. In civil life, trying to just provide, he, he struggled. Um, so Buckner and Grant, they knew each other from West Point. Buckner at this point knows he's got to surrender. Troops have left. Forrest has left. Floyd and, and Pillow have gotten the heck out of Dodge. What's he going to do? Um, so he is going to ask for terms of surrender, and he's hoping these are going to be generous terms of surrender. <laughs> can, um, I, can I read? Can yeah, I read the terms? Yes. Re, uh, right. So I'm just going to let me say this though. He's disappointed to receive Grant's terse response, which is yeah. Jack. So Buckner asked him, "What are your terms of surrender?" Grant responded, "These no terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted." I propose to move immediately upon your works. Buckner says, I must accept this ungenerous and unchivalrous terms if which you propose. <laughs> so yeah. he's there, got no choice. There starts the kind of the legend of what is Grant. Now now we've also got to look at this too, when the surrender happens. They are face to face. They're in the Dover Hotel, uh, which still stands. You need to go there. It's really cool. They've got some awesome stuff inside there talking about that surrender. Um, but the distribution of forces under his command, incident to an unexpected change of commanders, an overwhelming force under your command compel me, notwithstanding the brilliant success of the Confederate arms yesterday, the day before, to accept, as you said, your ungenerous and unchivalrous terms which you propose. The Confederates had been successful. They had pushed Grant. You had some, sounds to me, some generals that just said, it got cold feet. Um, Because really, you look at the forces engaged at that time, they were not that, you know, Grant's got a lot of men, but... Yeah, Grant's got, what would you say, 24,000... And you still got about... Roughly sixteen thousand Confederates. Yeah, sixteen thousand Confederates. In the end, killed will be five hundred and seven. For um, I don't know why this. I it has it listed here as the Army of the Tennessee. I thought it was the Army or the. I thought it was the District of Cairo. I didn't think it was the Army of Tennessee. I may be wrong though. Um, five hundred and seven killed, nineteen hundred. Uh, wounded and 208 captured and then let's go back to the confederates we said there's 16,000 engaged 327 killed 1100 wounded 12,392 captured 
So that's going to make up a brunt of your casualties. I actually learned recently that one of those was my ancestor. So that's pretty crazy. Oh, cool. Capture cool. at Fort Donaldson, 26 Mississippi. Cool. Uh, it is cool to note as a Valley guy here, um, you got um, – McCausland. McCausland. And Wharton. And Wharton. Wharton. So Wharton you've got like there? probably the 51st Virginia in, in there. So that's pretty neat because um, they end up in the ocean door. Right? They end oh, up here in the Lou, but, um, Lou Wallace yeah. does too, does he not? Lou Wallace uh, will go up to Monocacy. He'll save the – basically save the capital um, when you get down to it. It's all these guys out west making their way back home. All it is roads interesting to, to see valley. it shift around. Yeah, Everybody yeah. comes it back is, to the valley at some point. I mean, at some points you'll see, you know, we talk about John C. Breckenridge in 1864 being here in the valley. Mm-hmm. He's in Vicksburg, 1863. Um, so is Nathaniel Kimball. Who are we listening who to? Who is here in 1862 fighting just outside of Winchester. Um, over the weekend, Aaron and I were down at the Longwood University uh, Civil War Conference yeah, put and on by the, the Appomattox of, Petersburg well, you, Preservation and, Society and yes, the National Park the, Service. And the National Park Service. Um, Great conference. Yeah, the one of the talks was about the Battle of Secessionville. Yeah. And I think South it's Carolina. Horatio Wright's um, division or brigade is engaged at that battle. And it was just interesting to learn about that. It's a name I find so common in, you know, 1864 here mm-hmm. in the Valley. So it, it is often fun to realize that our – you know, celebrity names that we know from our famous battles here in the Valley lived a life before they made it here. So. Yeah, they've been all over the place. Yeah, I just don't, I don't like to accept well, it, though. One thing I'd like to note. Note it. After, after you know, we talk about the terms of surrender, what um, Buckner says to Grant, but when they actually meet face-to-face there in the Dover Hotel, uh, Grant's going to even talk in his mem- memoirs about how the meeting with Buckner in the course of their conversation was actually very friendly. Um, he said to, and this is Grant talking, he said to me that if I had been in command, I would not have given, I have not have got up Donaldson so easily as I did. And I told him, this is Grant talking again, I told him that if he had been in command, I should not have tried the way I did. Uh, I invested their lines with a smaller force than they had to defend them. And at the same time, had sent a brigade full 5,000 strong around by water. I relied upon their commander to allow me to come up safely outside of their works. Yeah, I think, I think if, I'm, if I'm recollecting correctly, that he had Lou Wallace's guys on the boats maybe. And then when the boats yeah, were coming Wallace. down the, the, the Cumberland or up the Cumberland... Um, it takes too long or something, and that's when he orders them to just come off the boat, just come join the go. fight. Yep. And I think that's Lou Wallace's guys maybe, and they come from the river down and, and end up joining the fight and filling, filling yeah. in when they're, they're needed. Filling in where they're needed. And, you know, you look at this, so we talked about in the beginning of this episode what this does in the Western theater. Not only does it open up your rivers and everything, but now the Union – aside from McClellan, has another national celebrity. Now, Halleck will take a lot of credit yeah. for what happens. Ha- I'm sorry. Halleck. Halleck really didn't have anything to do yeah. with it. He just said, yeah, it's okay. Um, Grant will be promoted to major general for his victories here in Tennessee. Um, and then he'll have subsequent success at Shiloh, Vicksburg, Chattanooga, which will earn him the rank of lieutenant general. This is where you see Grant really start to shine. Yeah. You know, and then we'll see him. You think about Ulysses S. Grant. He's captured the army, you know, an entire Confederate army at Fort Donaldson. Yeah. He's going to capture another one at Vicksburg. He'll capture another one at Petersburg. He's going to get an army out of harm's way at Chattanooga. He's a beast. Yeah, he was a beast. But he, you know, they call him a butcher and things like that um, because of the amount of casualties. Yes, he he did use the war of attrition, but you look at how Grant maneuvered. Grant was a heck of a general, and I know that sometimes is not the most popular thing to say. Well, I think, I mean, and we can talk about Appomattox another day. It's totally totally different episode, but I think the way he handled Appomattox is to be commended in some sort of way as well. Absolutely. Um, So He followed Lincoln's vision in that. All of this, I mean, you look at all of this, this is what ultimately leads to him just after the war, three years after the war, 1868, Ulysses S. Grant is elected president. Yeah. 
of the United States. And I think this is where, but this is where it sets, you know, this is what sets the tone. Yeah. This is where grant, you know, grant that we know really begins. Yeah. And and it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, That's one way to sum it up. Now here's, here's another thing we talked about. Just want to go back to the relationship between Buckner and grant. We talked about how Buckner had kind of gotten grant out of some stuff after the surrender of Fort Donaldson, which, you know, Grant icily rejected his surrender conditions, said unconditional surrender. Grant's going to later offer money, should he need it during his capture, to Buckner as, as kind of a repayment. So I think these guys still end up as friends down the line. Um, obviously, they're on opposite sides. But he also is going to provide hungry rebel troops with rations and uh, he's going to forbade any formal ceremony designed to humiliate the men in their defeat. This is where we see Grant. You will see this at Vicksburg. We'll see this at Appomattox. We'll yeah. see this at Chattanooga. We'll see this at the end of the war. This is what makes Grant a different general from all these other generals. He's not about celebration. He's about okay. It's over. Well, he knows how to clean. He knows how to clean up the mess. Let's clean up yeah. the yeah. mess. Yeah. yeah. Now, one well, thing. That this is almost off topic here for those folks, as we mentioned with McCausland and Wharton, do they get captured here or are they, do they make it out or do they get captured and get exchanged? Like what leads to them making their way back? A lot of these troops end up getting exchanged. Like I know my ancestor goes to fight on Yeah, Mm -hmm. after this. um, I think this is the largest capture to date during the It was, yeah, to Mm -hmm. that point, it was the largest capture of any troops in any war leading up until that point, America's been in combined. So that's not saying much, but it's saying much, you know, um, for a young nation and the wars that had been in, this is the largest total, uh, of capture of troops. I mean, it's an impressive military feat regardless of, it's, it's just crazy. It's like, so, Mm -hmm. so, so think about this though. There are repercussions that come out of this. Now, it's a great feat. We've got two forts out. We've just taken two big rivers. We've got all the supplies. But we talked about Halleck earlier, right? So, after the capture of Fort Donaldson and Henry, uh, news is going to news is going to travel faster in that time, uh, surprisingly. Grant's going to be this big national hero, right? To everybody except for one person. And that one person is going to be Henry Halleck. Halleck was instrumental in supporting Grant, but he wasn't stationed in Tennessee. He didn't participate in the in the campaigns. So Grant's going to receive all the adoration from the public. And Halleck's going to get ignored. That's going to make him jealous. Halleck, we call him old brains, you know. Um, if you look at him, he's a, he's an interesting looking dude. Uh, but he's jealous of the attention given to a man that he felt was beneath him. And he started going to go behind the scenes and start to undermine Grant. That's where we're going to get the 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 talks about breaking up his drinking and things like that. Yeah. And it, you know, and then you, you go to the Battle of Shiloh, and we won't get too far into that because that will probably be an episode at some point, but you go to the Battle of Shiloh, and how he's surprised on the first day. And that just plays into Halleck's uh, hand with that. Um. But, you know, so you've got some jealousy that happens there. Um, he, he even is going to make false assertions to Grant that, you know, during some of these times, he's had no communication from General Grant for more than a week. He left his command without my authority and went to Nashville. I can get no returns, no reports, no information of any kind from him, which isn't true. Um, he had let Alec know where he was going, what was happening, and Halleck just ignored it. So, uh, But the general-in-chief at that time was George B. McClellan. He's going to take the bait and reply that generals must observe discipline as well as private soldiers. Do not hesitate to arrest him at once if the good of the service requires it. Bold coming from McClellan. That's freaking <laughs> bold, man. And, and you know, Grant is going to be stunned by this. So this, this is all a result of him winning. Which I think is crazy. Um, Even more so coming from McClellan. <laughs> two weeks after the victory at Donaldson, he's virtually in arrest without a command. The guy that's going to basically win the Civil War does not have a command. 
after he has taken Fort Donaldson and started to split the Confederacy. I just find that crazy. I mean, eventually they're they're it's going to catch up with Halleck and you know President Lincoln will demand proof uh, of everything. Um, I think Lincoln even at one point is going to say, you know, when they talk about Durant being a drunk and everything, so what, what what type of whiskey does he drink? Because like for my rest of my generals to do that. Um, Apparently, old crow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd, I'd like to, honestly. I think it would be cool to sit down. This is off topic, but I think it'd be set, cool to sit down and have a shot of bourbon or whiskey with General Grant. I bet that would just be a fun time. Just to pick the mind. Just to pick the mind and just see how he really was at that time. But anyway, uh, those the outcome of this is this is what's opening your Western theater. This is a momentum Taste shift. I would, the stage. I wouldn't say a turning point, but a momentum shift. Well, it opens the door for Vicksburg and all oh, that. Oh, it's going to age you. Shiloh, Vicksburg. You know, again, you look at the map, you should really see how close Shiloh really is to everything uh, compared to where they're at with these forts. And it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing feat that Grant does with the control, you know, with the cooperation, not control, but cooperation of the Navy to get to where he's at. Um, and they'll do it again at Vicksburg and New yeah. Orleans and all these places. It, it's amazing what what they do. Yeah, well, perfect. Well, that is Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. If you enjoy historical stories just like this one, um, go ahead and get on History Fix. The You can explore movies, short films, documentaries. All Battlefields and Bourbon podcast fans can receive an extra 20% off their first year's annual subscription. It's 2024, so if you're looking for something new, Something to, to, to watch as, as we go into the new year. Um, you know, start that subscription now. It's easy to remember. Start of the year, renew next year at the yeah, same time. Absolutely. So all podcast listeners get an extra 20% off when you sign up at www.historyfix.com and use promo code BATTLEFIELD. That's B-A-T-T-L-E-F-I-E-L-D. Every subscription includes a seven-day risk-free trial, so you can escape into history today with History Fix. So thank you to our friends over at History Fix. Speaking of that. Oh, speaking. little spoiler. Okay. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. Okay. But there is a possibility that possibly Aaron Civil War Travels may end up on there. Uh, Uh-oh. At some oh. point, oh, yeah. you know, there's still some... You spoke it into existence, so yes, now it's not going to happen. I'm speaking it into mm-hmm. existence. Uh it would be a, it would be a, a obviously a boost to me for that, but uh, even if it doesn't happen, History Fix is an amazing place. Yeah. There's so many things. I am proud to say I do have a little part on History Fix. Uh, Whitney's Metal, I great do, great short film, great short film. Oh. I do a voiceover on there, so yeah, you, know, I'm kind you of are a, credited on there. I'm kind of a big deal, Jack. <laughs> Aaron's oh. kind of a big deal. If you want to catch more of Aaron's stuff, just go to his YouTube, Facebook, Aaron Civil War Travels. Um, yeah. everything from, you know, all the way as far West as Alcatraz, California, Alcatraz, California, uh, we just released Piedmont, uh, Piedmont, the battle of Piedmont here in Virginia, June 5th, 1864 was just released. Yeah. So check that out. Um, so that's where you can check Aaron out on, uh, if you support, if you like what we're doing here at the podcast, just give us a like, subscribe, uh, share with your friends, leave some feedback positive feedback maybe hopefully <laughs> it's negative we we'll shoot us a private message um so we we support everybody uh, we appreciate everyone's support and listening uh we're excited to do more western theater battles uh we hope to go f- north with some battles as well gettysburg and beyond so we shall see but um excited for the new year excited for the next episode we've got a great guest coming on at the end of february so stay tuned for that episode uh anything else fellas Pretty well covered it. Yeah, I think one once again I want to thank you guys for having me on. I, I feel very privileged to be able to come here and and talk about the Civil War. Yeah. Jack, you you know, I mean Elijah and I've met over the last couple months, but Jack, you've known me for years. You know this is my passion. This oh, yeah. is what I absolutely love to talk about and do. Um and so I just I just want to thank you guys for having me on, uh giving me this platform to be, just yeah. to talk about my yeah. passion. Always a fun time having you, know. you on. Whether people go to the YouTube page or not, that's great. But we're here and we're talking about yeah. this. And I think it's a, a great thing. Here for future generations to learn from. That's so right. We appreciate everyone that listens now, though. So anything else, Elijah? I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening. That was Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. And we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks, guys.